Hi, my name is Patricia and I'm here in Copenhagen, excited to introduce you to Martin Taulo. Martin is a Danish photographer and he's been part of the Reconstruction of Identities project. Uh, the project was launched in 2018 and it explores themes such as the European identity and cultural heritage. And Martin will tell us more about his own project today, which is called Home is Where Your Heart Is. Hi, Martin. Hi, nice to meet you and thanks for having me here. Nice to meet you too and thanks for joining us. So uh, I can tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a Danish-based photographer. I live in a small remote island called Bornholm in the Baltic Sea. And I've been part of, of uh, IDE, Identity Dialogues Europe, and as a, a residency. And my contribution, I've, um, it's, it's partly work from archives and also new work that I'm actually combining. And this has to do with the fact that I've been working on um, issues and the addressing of, of displaced people um, from the Middle East and, and in Europe. And I'm relating these um, dip diptychs from, from setting images alongside from my archives with uh, the homes uh, that I've found and portrayed here in, in Denmark, actually windows of homes. And your series is called uh, Home is Where Your Heart Is. Uh, what's the story behind this title? The, the whole idea actually arose from, because of my work and I've been traveling a lot inside of Europe and especially in Germany, I've done a lot of work in relation to refugees. I'm also running this uh, audiovisual platform called Refugee Today. And I was in Germany working uh, in relation to some uh, guys from from Serbia, uh, some actually some Roman uh, uh, guys that that were caught in Germany, in Essen, they were classified as refugees, but they weren't allowed to, to leave Essen. And I had an interview with this uh, guy Selamat, and and he told me that um, we we talked about this 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 term of home. Where is your home, and how does it feel not to have a home? And he, and he actually said that home is where your heart is. That that this was the, this was the big discovery in his time as a, a lifetime of uh, as a refugee for more than thirty years because he came to Germany at, at the age of three and he was still caught in the system. And this actually was the 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 the. Um, the phrase that I brought to this project because I thought it made perfectly sense in, in all of, of the, the line of work that I've been doing for so many years, for more than five years now. And you could say that your serious focus is on the new population of Europe because in the past couple of years we've seen a large influx of people from mainly Syria and Africa which has made many people nervous uh, about the cultural changes that might follow. Uh, what is your take on these changes and the idea of Europe as perhaps more a dynamic than a static size? I mean, I believe that, that uh, society is a constant change. And of course, we have a, a, a the society is being influenced by the, the influx of refugees and, and people coming from outside of, of, of EU. But, uh, my, my my take on it is that we shouldn't be afraid of this these changes because in a way in my own discovery I found out how we can actually uh, inspire and contribute contrib contribute to each other's um, culture and heritage and and if you look at history this this is also how things have everything is in a in a, in a constant changing uh, organism even the language. And I myself, I, I ended up getting married to uh, Rowan, which is a Syrian refugee from, from Damascus. So I'm, ex I'm basically living the life in between different cultures. And this makes perfectly sense when I'm then working in relation to, to a project like this in IDE, because I, I know from uh, the, the everyday life how life is influenced and, and being at, di at different uh, levels uh, due to the fact how how we are with our cultural backgrounds. And in that way, we're perhaps uh, more alike than people think because we're all being influenced by each other. Yeah, what was the question? Um, I just said that in that way, we are perhaps more alike um, than we think because we're all Definitely. being influenced. Yeah. The, the, the whole learning f for me, in not only in IDE, but the, 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 the whole journey that I've been uh, that I started more than five years ago is, is that 
we by far are more connected than we can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And this has have been one of the big findings at a personal level for me, how, how connected we are and how much we need to, to actually understand and realize this. And of course, uh, the identity of Europe is changing, but it's been doing this for, for centuries. So this is not something new. And I think it's important that we embrace this. And you've already mentioned that in your series you are working with these diptychs. Um, could you tell us a bit more about um, how you've been working with them as we see some of your photos here? Yeah. So what I did specifically, I, I had been traveling in Bulgaria and Greece uh, in the bordering areas of Turkey. I went there with a writing journalist, uh, Florian Elapti, which, which I'm working with uh, on several occasions. And we wanted to, to take a closer look at the, the route and the crossing areas where, where the refugees are actually crossing the borders to get into the, the, the EU. And following this trace, um, I got a, a lot of photo series, by, by, uh, amongst others, by this guy called Maher. We found him in the, in the hospital in Bulgaria, uh, where he had lost one of his legs and four toes on, on one of his uh, foot, the, the, the foot being left back. And um, he had actually tried to get back to Turkey because he had family there. So they were, were separated and, and his youngest child uh, was suffering or having the diagnosis of uh, Down syndrome and, and she had to go through a heart surgery. So he got desperate and jumped the, the freezing river uh, in December of 2018. And then he ended up in the hospital. He, he, he survived 18 days in the wilderness and we found him then in, in the hospital in Bulgaria and told his story. And this is one of the stories that I've actually placed in relation to, to one of the safe Danish homes. And, and it's, it's also to, to make a contrast and show how, because in a way this is something that, that Maher and his family is dreaming of, this life in, in the safe life in EU. So I'm, I'm trying to create this contrast in between what we do have here and what many refugees and, and displaced people are actually dreaming of to, to, to gain again uh, since they've lost it back in their um, devastated homes. Yeah. And as you've said, for, for many years, your work has, has focused on refugees and asylum seekers and displaced people, as well as the structures in society that their lives are affected by. Um, since you first started, have, do you think you've seen any changes? Definitely, and this has to do with the, the laws that are really changing, especially in Denmark. I mean, Denmark is one of the countries that have the strictest rules and, and constantly changing rules uh, in terms of uh, the treatment of people that are in need of protection, those we classify as refugees, people who are displaced. and. This has been in a constant and rapid change, not only in Denmark, but, but Denmark seems to be one of the front runners in terms of setting up more uh, strict and uh, harsh rules. We, we had the case of uh, last year when, when the Danish government uh, with the majority tried to uh, run some cases and send uh, Syrian refugees back to Syria, even though it's not safe. And they, they lost the case and I reckon if it had gone through, this would have been tested by the European courts and also the, the, the International Court of, of, um, of Justice. But uh, this has definitely changed within the, the, the five years that I've been working on this, both politically, also in, in, the, in the masses of the, of the population, where at least in my opinion, I see that there is a rise of, of a right wing uh, approach to people who are displaced. And many people have already criticized these structures and these political decisions. And you could perhaps say that your work is also quite political. Is that also how you view your work? I mean, my work is uh, indeed very political and it's, it's a standpoint that I'm taking um, deliberately. It, I actually feel this is an obligation because I, I'm, I'm very fortunate and, and um, privileged to be able to do the things that I'm doing, sitting in this big studio, uh, it, being able to travel wherever I want to go. And when I 
go out and meet these people in, 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 in very often in the most difficult and poor conditions. Uh, I feel that an obligation to go back and actually bring this to the table and say we, we need to look at this not as the masses uh, and as, as a three minute and, and 14 seconds feature in, in the news media, but we need to look at this at eye level. And this is actually something that I've built into my, uh, uh, my photos is that I usually take the photos at eye level. I did a whole study before I started my whole work on how is refugees portrayed in, in the year of uh, 2002 or three to 2013. And I, I realized that usually we take photos of refugees from, from above and we take the power uh, above them. And this I, I uh, thought about how can I break this and, and, and work at a, an eye level also visually. And this is built into to how I'm actually working with my content to, to say we, we are even. We, we need to look at each other at eye level. Mm. And also, you're originally a trained painter from the Danish Arts Academy. Um, how is working with photography different than, than working with, with painting? In my opinion, it, it doesn't really differ. I mean, working um, as a painter uh, or doing photography, or if you're working with architecture or other visual fields, form fields, in my opinion, it's basically the same language that we're speaking. It's, it's just a matter of learning how to uh, master your toolbox and being able to speak freely from your own uh, personal uh, experience and, and with your own personal signature. Mm. And in, in this matter, uh, I feel very close related to the years spent on, on learning how to paint. I, I mean, I'm actually feeling that I'm, I'm painting with the, with the camera when I'm doing my work. And also, I could say that, that to me, the, the composition and lightning and all of this is, of course, important. But most importantly for me is the, the being at present at the moment when you're working and, and captivating the stories of the people that you're working with. This is by far more important to me, and I feel like I'm dancing with these people when, when I'm actually out working in the field. So that's my approach on, on, on how I do my photography. Yeah. And how has it been for you personally to learn about the people you portray and to depict their often really tragic story? I mean, I, I'm, I'm deeply involved in the cases. Sometimes I even uh, cross the line of being a documentary uh, or journalist uh, in, in terms of uh, I have helped. I actually helped Maha, the guy that you saw uh, lying next to this Danish home, and I, I went back and I collected money together with uh, with Florian. We we actually set up a campaign, and we managed to get money so he could get a a, a prosthesis like um, a, a few months later. So I do feel a deep connection to these people um, that I'm meeting in field. So I'm I'm not separating myself in that sense and. Uh, um, I think it's important, and I think it's it's also when you're working in this field because I'm usually I'm meeting people that that are at the the edge of dying, uh, especially when we're talking Lebanon and these places they're living on a very dear conditions, uh, um, and you can't lock this out. You bring it with you when you have been sitting with people that have, that have lost uh, all of their family, lost their legs or their eyes or, or whatever then. Uh, seen their uh, loved one once burn uh, alive in front of them, then th this is the kind of, of things that you, even though my imagery is very subtle and you see the, the people, there's some very strong and and tragic stories behind the, the, the work and this I can't separate myself from actually. Yeah. And a lot of your work is also based on your travels and for obvious reasons, traveling isn't, isn't gonna be um going to be possible for perhaps a long time. So do you have any plans on what to work on then? Are you going to continue with this series or work with your archival material or? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm basically I've, I've been uh, not stuck, but I've been staying at for the, for the first time in 12 years, I've been staying at this island for more than three and a half months. Um, <laughs> I'm working on my archives actually, and also some local projects uh, portraying uh, local fishermen. Um, and then I have a lot of commercial work which is running uh, alongside. And um, so, and I, 
I reckon I, I won't be able to travel maybe until next year because there are some expectations of new COVID-19 coming at in the, in the fall time. But I will use the time clever and, and just build up uh, and, and work on, on the tons of, of content that I've actually haven't released yet and that I'm still working on. Uh, so my, my work continues and I'm looking forward to get back to to the Middle East and, and out in the field at, at some point later. Yeah, of course. And we look forward to seeing more of your work. So thank you so much for taking your time to tell us about your project. And uh, for those of you watching, um, Martin's images are right now exhibited at Sona Boulevard in Westerbo. Uh, and if you're watching from abroad, you can read more about the project on the, on the website or follow us on Instagram. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching. <laughs>